Somebody's out there mowing the grass while we're filming the show. Welcome back to the Behind the Well Show. Your host, Roger Abel, here with Elias Randall. Eli, what's happening today? Not a lot. Just uh, just getting going here. We're going to film a podcast. and um, I had to do some running around today. That's about it for me. What's up with you? That's all I have going on. I only had like two or, two or three hours of sleep last night, so my coffee. What happened? I woke up and I got stuck watching Netflix. Oh, yep. I don't know. Have you ever done that? Um, yes, but I'd make an effort not to do that because I need to sleep. Have I ever told you my story about, um, the Ozark show? Uh, you used to stay up late and watch it. Well, so I tried to watch it in the beginning. So I'm like, well, this is about like a financial advisor. And I watched like one episode, I'm like super boring. Like I can't touch the show. So like a year later, everybody's like, Ozarks is the best. So one night I couldn't sleep. I went down to the basement and started watching it. Next thing I know, it's eight o'clock in the morning. The kids are ready to go to go to school. Ouch. Well, you know what happened? I didn't feel like going to work because I was up all night. So I went, stayed home and watched Ozarks all day. That's probably a fun day, though. I fell asleep. And guess what happened? I woke up again and, and started watching it. Ozarks. I watched like the first two seasons in three or four days, just straight up. I bet you're proud of that move. I'm not really, but you know, one, <laughs> you know, there's those shows where you just get into it and you can't get away from it. I'm watching that show you on Netflix. I think it's been out for a long time, but uh, it's actually a little, little spooky to be honest with you. My wife won't watch it because of her anxiety, so she didn't watch that show. Yeah, the last two shows I watched that I binge watched were uh, Ozark, and that was a few years ago. And then it was either right before that or right after that. Um, all the Sopranos came out. I think we either got HBO or it came out on Amazon Prime or something, and I had never seen it, so I watched. Yeah, I used to stay up late watching that. Actually, Sopranos would be a good one to go back and watch again. I bet I could watch that entire series probably multiple What's times. What's the biker one? Did you watch the biker one? No, I've never gotten into um, – I don't know what it's called, but no. That was probably one of my favorite ones with Jack. Who's his name? Jax, I think. It was really good. Um, Sons of Anarchy. Is that what it was? Sons of Anarchy, yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, but, never seen it. But I thought today we'd talk about what we would consider safe investments, mainly because they're kind of back in vogue. And um, you know, one of the things that makes me think people are looking for safe investments is some of the stuff we did today to prepare – for this show is we went to Yahoo Finance and just wanted to see what people are talking about. And here's the top 10 headlines from Yahoo Finance. What to do in a CD matures. Are CDs worth it? How to open a high yield savings account. How much money should I have an emergency account? What's an emergency savings fund? Should I have a short or a long term CD? CDs versus bonds. What is a CD? How to set up a CD ladder and how to open a CD? So it's funny how the, the times have changed. This is like a dirty word for the last 15 years. Nobody wanted to buy these things. And I think there's two things happening. One, we've seen the rates on CDs get to a place where I could say it's quite attractive. You know, there's CDs out there. You can go shop the market, but, you know, getting 5% on a CD, you know, this, this show's being filmed on the 25th of May. So things obviously can change. But there's five percent CDs all around. You can open the paper. You can open, go to the, go to the internet. You can call our office. Either way, like there's good CD rates. But I think there's another reason people are interested in it, and it's that if you look at where consumer confidence is right now, it's like at an all time low. Twenty only twenty three percent are bullish about the short term market. I mean, they actually think the market's going to do well in the short term. That's down from twenty nine percent last week. That's a 30% drop in confidence in a week. And, you know, it's one, this market, we talked about this, I don't know, seven or eight months ago. People are going to start losing more confidence if the market doesn't spring back right away. The last two market corrections before this one, 
the market pop right back. 2018, fourth quarter of 18, market was down 18%, came right back the first quarter. COVID went down 40-ish percent, came back in 90 days. Well, this one, it's grinding lower and now it's just kind of holding in a range and there's not a lot of excitement in it. You've got the debt ceiling. So people in general are just starting to lose confidence and looking for a place to go earn some some interest with basically little or no no risk to it. And it is nice um, that CDs are a reasonable alternative now. So I think some of it is for a long time, almost all investors had to be invested a little bit more aggressively than they would like to achieve the returns that they need to, to make their financial planning work out and to make their investments work out. But I, one of the things I've been talking with people about, okay, what's the reality of this? And investing is typically in its most simplistic version. Okay. What is your time horizon? Right. And what's your risk tolerance? So, you know, CDs are, are, CDs over the long term going to outperform people's stock portfolio? No, most likely not. I don't believe they will over the long term. So there's a lot of investors that this is probably not suitable for, for your long term planning, like people younger than 55, park some money in a CD, maybe like kind of CD ladder, your emergency fund or something. So you can make some interest on it. On the other side of that, people who are in retirement now or nearing retirement, I'm sure it feels really good to take some risk off the table and park it in a in an asset that has no risk and you can make 5% interest on it. That probably feels pretty good. Actually increases the probability of success or increases the person's financial confidence score, whatever you want to call it, because you all of a sudden get this this product that doesn't have any variance. Like it doesn't go down 10 one year. It just makes the same rate. And if you think about a, a client, we talk about having just what's your fair rate of return goal. Like let's say you want to make 7%. Well, if you could put half the money in something that makes five that you know, and you put the other half of the money in whatever, let's just say 50% in the stock market does 9%. Well, Half of nine is four and a half and a half of five is two and a half. You got a 7% rate of return with half the market risk. Like it could be a reasonable alternative for people. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, I've started to read articles, bonds are back because bond yields follow these CD rates. This is all, all these CDs are priced off of, you know, the treasury market. And let's talk a little bit about the pros and the cons and some strategies that I'm starting to talk about people with stock. I'm starting to talk with people about that are honestly a little bit unconventional to wisdom over the last decade. And I think people, when I bring it up, are going to think about it. But, you know, what are some of the pros, Elias? You know, I, I know safety is the number one pro. It's FDIC insured. Do you think there's any other pros associated with, with the CD? Uh, yes, not only from just like the numbers and the financial side of it. I think there are psychological benefits for older investors, older investors that are more conservative, knowing, I, I feel people are more comfortable with the fluctuation in their riskier assets when they have some money parked in something that's not fluctuating at all. It can, it's almost kind of like a, I don't know, like an umbrella or like a safety blanket. It's like, okay, well, I know that part's not fluctuating. So can this help me? All right. Cause what do we know? We know that if you live through the bad times, History has shown us. I know we both believe that the markets will do well over time, but the biggest hurdle is you got to keep people invested when things are not going well. And I, I think, I think in addition to the just the pure return and all that type of stuff, I think psychologically people um, have a lot of peace of mind with products like that. Yeah, and, and those are really the, the the positives are there. It's flexible terms. You've got FDIC insurance and you have a predictable rate. There's a few cons, but honestly, a lot of the things that we've seen as cons with CDs over the last 10 years, some of those may be evaporating. And I'm going to talk about why and maybe a strategy that you could look look to employ. But the first con that I th think of when I think of a CD is liquidity, because really it's a, it's a product that you need to hold till maturity to get the, the maximum benefit. 
So, you know, if liquidity is a concern, let's say somebody's doing this in their their emergency fund for say, you know, just to talk about, you wouldn't want to put a five-year CD in your emergency fund. You wouldn't want to put all your emergency fund into a CD, but could you buy a three-month CD or a six-month or a nine-month or maybe all three of them and have a ladder inside of your emergency fund if that's what it called for? And it's been a lot easier to have cash because you're making a yield on it. So that's the first thing is liquidity is kind of the biggest con of, or uh, the biggest drawback or biggest con of a CD. The second thing is inflation risk. And for the last 20 years, nobody's really wanted to buy CDs because what have the rates been? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And conventional wisdom has been, well, if interest rates go up, I want to own a three, six, nine, or 12 month CD so that I don't run the risk of inflation getting away from me. And I'm making 1% on a CD and now inflation's seven and I can get 5% on a new CD. Like that's the risk. It's interest rate risk. So one of the things I've been talking with people about and a strategy people should be looking at potentially is the last 10 years, everybody wanted less than 12 months. Why? If rates go up. If rates go they up. Want, yeah, they want to be able to roll it into a higher paying yep. one or rebalance, well, whatever you want to say. So that. this is, we're backwards now. Do we think rates are going higher? Inflation's coming down. I, I don't think many people believe rates are going much higher. So I've been talking here. to people about maybe you want to have a two-year CD. Everybody should ask themselves this question. If I buy a CD today, I can buy a 12-month CD or a two-year CD for about the same rate. It's really similar, within 0.2%. Mm -hmm. If I buy a 12-month CD that pays 5% and at renewal, the rate's three, how am I going to feel? You're going to wish you would have went longer. Right. If you buy a two-year CD and rates go up and you are getting 5% on the two-year CD, I'm just using a number. I'm not saying you get that. I'm using a round number for illustrative purposes. You have 5% on a two-year CD and rates go to 5.2. Are you really going to care? No. No. You're going to care no. more if you didn't have it locked in. So I've started talking to people about stretching out the duration of the CD because most people would be really happy to get 5% all the time on their money. Uh, yeah, a lot of people. I mean, and no risk. We have client. We had a client the other day. He wanted a five year. He's like, I just want to have this rate for five years. Yeah, fair he's enough. Happy with it. And actually, yep. the five year rate was lower than the one year, but he was happy with the rate he was getting over five years. It wasn't our recommendation. He brought it up and wanted to do it. And I actually think he's got some. He, here's what it is: that individual person, he has goals for his money. And his goal is to keep his principal the same. And he's older, so he's taking distributions out. And I know the last 10 years, he's had to take more risk than he wanted to take. And now he's and he's a guy who walks in every single time with an Excel spreadsheet. He's checking all the rates of every product out there. But he went and figured out and said, if I get that rate, even with my required distributions, guess what's going to happen? My principal is going to stay the same. And he's happy with that. So he's not being greedy. He's no. locking in what'll achieve his goal that he gave to his money. It's kind of like, um, you know, we talked about it was uh, Dr. Peterson, Jordan Peterson, and how you got to give your money purpose. He's given his money purpose. Right. And that, and he's a very risk averse person, which you can still be in it. You can still be adverse to risk and be an investor. Right. But what this particular person has done is they've stayed in their lane. They know the type of products that they should buy and use. And I, I'm guessing, you know, when the market goes up a lot, yeah, you probably always have a little bit of, oh, well, I could have done better. But to decide that you don't like the fluctuations and you know exactly how you're going to invest, like to me, understanding that and sticking to your, like you just said, your vision and your plan, that's how you be a successful investor. Right, we're not all we're not all wired one to accept all the risks that are out there, and there's even you know even myself. There's people that invest so much more risky and aggressively than I would ever even consider doing. Well, why are they doing that? Because they can tolerate those risks, so that's what they should do. So one of the things you'd mentioned earlier is that you know for us as advisors, having higher interest rates makes our job a little easier. And I think 
what you're really alluding to, Elias, is our bucket strategy that we have. And if you think about how that works, we always have a liquid bucket, an income bucket, a growth bucket, and really, you know, what we call irreplaceable capital bucket, the bucket that we don't want to lose money on. And, you know, usually in that liquid bucket, we're going to focus there. We, we've always tried to keep anywhere from six to two years of cash in there for someone who's actually retired. You know, if they're working, we don't necessarily do that because they don't need that amount of liquidity in there. But if they're a year or two away from retirement, we start to build these cash reserves. Well, I can tell you that the amount of money we had kept as advisors in cash is less than we would today over the last several years, partly because who wants to put $100,000 of cash at 0.08%? Nobody. Yeah. And there's actually yield that you can make out there. It's right exciting now. now. Like yeah. we, we actually can get that bucket working for you. Instead of having this block of money that's just there for safety, we can get that block of money working. And a lot of the ways we do that is through a ladder. I mean, we buy a three, six, nine, 12 month CD and have them maturing at different times to match when those distributions are coming out so that there's always liquidity in there for the client. So if anybody's looking for information on how to build that bucket strategy, you can go to btwellshow.com, click get started. We can kind of walk you through how we do that, how we build a CD ladder, if that's something you're interested in. Um, and if you've never thought about it, you should talk to somebody about it. I mean, if you have cash sitting in the bank right now, go talk to your banker. Say, hey, what kind of a short-term rate can I get in this cash if you know you don't need it in the next three months? Yeah, th there's really no reason to just have cash just sitting. I mean, yeah, you don't want it like your emergency fund. Okay, is it prudent to take all of your emergency fund and put in a 12-month CD? Probably not. Could you do some sort of ladder? Because, I mean, the, the reality is it's there for you're the not going to need, yeah, and you're not going to need all of your emergency fund at one time. Typically, well, that that would be a pretty let's, extraordinary. Let's event. say somebody has a fully funded emergency fund, six months worth of funds. Well, okay, and think about why you have the emergency fund. It's for the unexpected expense. But the reason we do six months, because that's if you lose your job. Yeah, they're like you're replacing short term income. Right. So if you had six months, could you take three months of that and put it in a CD? Because you know, in three months, if you lost your job, it's coming due. It's coming due. Yeah. So those are the strategies you need to think about. And that's just maximizing your dollars. It, five years ago, it didn't matter. You weren't making more in a C, significantly more in a CD than we, you were in your cash account. Well, now it does. Yeah, so there's no... Right. Well, yeah. and the other thing, it's not just CDs. It could, just, could be high yield savings accounts. Like there's all kinds of ways to get yield. There's money market funds to get yield. You got to go find a way to get your cash working for you if you have it. Don't just leave it in the bank at half a percent right now because the only people making money on that's the bank. Yeah, you know, here's one thing I've been thinking about recently and one thing I really enjoy about our business is just how things are always evolving and you think about just the last couple of years how much time we spent talking about like stock picking and crypto in 2021 and now we're talking about CDs like you couldn't get further apart on the spectrum just well, in terms of risk and product and now people it's amazing you mentioned to someone that there's a 5% 12 months CD out there, their eyes light up. So it's just crazy. You know, it's not us talking about it. We're, it's the public talking about it because remember where we come up with our topics. I just listened to another segment on a podcast the other day that on just even treasuries, it's like everything that's safe and paying a decent yield right now. And it's funny because we say decent yield, but like historically, we're probably still kind of low, but it's kind of, it's perception, right? It's where we came from. And it's just, it's really incredible, but it, it it is good. And it's, like we said before, it's a reasonable alternative now for certain parts of your money. And it is nice that it's out there. The next thing I want to talk about, and this is a, a meeting I had with a prospect the other day. And I think this is probably more common than, than you think and I think. And it's married couples leaving money on the table with their 401k. And it sounds counterintuitive. But let me explain the situation. I had husband and wife. Husband's putting in 15% of his paycheck into retirement. Okay. He's getting his company match. Wife isn't doing anything because they just, you know, 15% of his paycheck is what they can afford. Wife's doing nothing. 
And they think they're doing the smart thing. They're getting a full company match on one of them. He's putting 15% away. They feel really good about it. And I brought up to them, I said, that's awesome. You're doing a great job savings, but it would actually make more sense for your husband to do eight and you to do seven. It's still 15%, but then you get your 3% match. Yeah, you got to get, you're right, get the match at both. We take it for granted. We take for granted that people know that. Yeah. When I said that to them, they're like, we've never even thought about that. We thought we were doing the right thing. We listened to Dave Ramsey say 15% of your paycheck. We got one to 15%. We hadn't really thought about doing the next one. That's interesting. And you know, you know exactly. Yeah. Dave Ramsey would say, yeah, you got to get the match at both places. If it's three percent. Once you're debt free, he would tell you that. Right. When you're debt free, but. Okay, yeah, that's kind of shocking. So I might have to start the married couples we work with. I might have to start making sure I ask them about that. I've got the vernacular. If they're both, if they're both working, make sure you both get in your match. It's the 401k arbitrage opportunity. Well, I it like is that. because think about it. that you They gave up a 100% return, meaning if the wife puts in three and they get three, that's 100% return. Like that's free money. Arbitrage is when there's no risk between yeah. two different things. They just literally put an extra 3%. So now let, let's say husband's, I think husband was doing 15. The company match was like five or four, something like that. I don't remember the exact number. Well, all of a sudden they had another 3%. So it went from 15% plus a company match of five plus another three. They're 23%. And you're, yeah, and they were you're, 20 you're saving before. rates. This, yeah, but your saving rates the same. Exactly. So your take home pay is not going to change at all. But you have to think about how people think about money a lot. They think they're saving more because one's 15%. We take it for granted. It's amazing. Like, yeah, you, yeah, if you told someone, well, I'm saving right. eight yeah. and he's saving seven, they think they're only saving that amount. They're saving exactly the same amount. 15 just sounds like they're saving more. Yeah, you know what? You're you're right. Because actually, the other day, on um, I actually had a conversation, and we're going back to the CD conversation. But it was six month paying whatever yield it was, and the comment was made to me. Well, yeah, that's eight percent over the year, right? And I just assume that people know that those are annualized returns, interest rates, right? Because I I just I I take that for granted. So then I realized, okay, I need to be more thorough sometimes in talking about that. And it's dangerous to assume that people just know how it works. Because I wouldn't want someone to buy a six-month CD and think, oh, I'm going to get 8% because it's, you know, it's four for the next six months. Well, it's four for the year, which is two over six months. Yeah. So. Well, it's why people work with us because they're hiring us to dissect the information for them. So, yeah, I mean, if anybody's struggling – trying to figure out what they should do. I think you just go to our website, btwellshow.com, click get started. We can answer your questions. If you have a question on putting together a premier bucket strategy, putting together, you know, a CD ladder, kind of us guiding you as to how you should do that. We'd be happy to help. Um, Elias, do you have any other closing remarks for the show today? Uh, If any, yeah, just reach out. If you want some help with anything, we'd be happy to help everyone. Um, Yeah. And that's it. Great. I want to thank everybody for listening. You can check us out at btwellshow.com.